introducing now Mikael Kubiska. So if you're working in the PCR field, you possibly heard his name a lot. Uh, so Michael is professor at the Institute of Biotechnology, the Czech Republic of Science, Academy of Science. And of course, he's also founder of the Tata Bio Center. You see it here on the slides. And in two weeks, there is a 20th anniversary. I'm invited, but unfortunately have some other appointment at this weekend, but we, we celebrate it next year, okay, in Friday. Yeah. So he's doing a lot of work uh, around PCR, digital PCR, next generation sequencing. And today he's introducing us in the two-tailed PCR for precision diagnostics. Please, Michael. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much, Michael, for the kind in, uh, introduction and, and uh, the organizers for uh, arranging this great uh, meeting. It's not easy during COVID, and I think it's you have done an impressive work, and I have learned a lot from the previous speakers. So that has been excellent. So what I will be doing today is that I will be presenting a variant of PCR. We call it two-tailed PCR or 2T PCR. That has certain advantages when analyzing, again, certain biomarkers. And one of them is, is microRNA that we've been speaking about quite a lot. So uh, you all are familiar with microRNAs. They are short. They don't have any particular common sequence. We have highly variable GC content. There are major sequences that are nearly identical. And uh, there may be uh, the, the a major microRNA sequence may be contained in its precursors. We have quite a lot of heterogeneity, like isomers, where you have end uh, modifications. And uh, well, that, that's how it is. And, and we have families that only differ in a single base. And that makes microRNA analysis generally very, very challenging. And indeed, if you look at the methods uh, that are currently being used, you, they, they all somehow make the microRNA longer. And the reason is very simple because a microRNA being about 22 bases, well, you can't really fit two regular PCR primers on, on that little stretch of RNA. So you have to do something. And, and, and the strategy, as I just said, is, is to make it longer. You can use a hairpin primer, you can extend it by tailing, or you can ligate something to that. And those methods work, but of course, if you add another chemical reaction, you're automatically compromising uh, the yields. And, uh, and, 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 and furthermore, when you then do PCR on that, only one of the PCR primers is really sensing the original microRNA sequence. The other primer will be sensing the sequence that you have added. And that also compromises, actually, in particular now, the specificity. So the strategy we designed was to use a two-tailed primer. A two-tailed primer is a single molecule that hybridizes to the target with both the five prime and three prime end. We call those hemiprobes. And the uh, primer is designed with a hairpin structure and that is really to protect from cross hybridization. So this is how the uh, uh, two-tailed primer binds. And what you see is that it binds, although each of the hemiprobes alone are way too short to hybridize with high affinity. However, what happens in practice is that when one of the hemiprobes happens to bind to the target, the other hemiprobe will automatically bind as well because of the very, very high local concentration due to the two hemiprobes being part of the same molecule. This is actually an old trick in physical chemistry uh, co referred to as cooperative binding. And since the uh, three prime hemiprobe has a free three prime hydroxyl end, it acts as a primer. And when the target is microRNA, well, it does prime the reverse transcription. So the reverse transcriptase will extend the three prime end of the two-tailed primer. And 
which means that we are end up with a pretty long cDNA. And then in the next step, the cDNA is amplified by regular PCR primers. However, note that with this design, the PCR primers shown in black, they are sensing both of them, the original microRNA sequence, which is coded in red and blue. This is just to illustrate the design co uh, concept. So in the top, we have uh, the microRNA target in blue and the two hemiprobes shown in yellow. We do a regular uh, qPCR and we obtain a CQ of 17.41. In the second slide, uh, the five prime hemiprobe uh, does not match. So it does not hybridize. And you can see that the CQ drops by almost nine cycles. That is, we have a cross reactivity of only 0.24%, very low yield here. Or if we remove the five prime hemiprobe altogether, it's essentially the same lousy yield. So this proves that we really need hybridization of both hemiprobes to have an efficient reaction. Now, what about specificity? Uh, again, uh, here uh, in, in blue is the microRNA. It's actually the same reaction as before. And in the bottom, we have a mismatch indicated in red. But look, the mismatch is outside the hemiprobes. So it is not sensed by the two-tailed primer. However, it is sensed in the downstream PCR reaction by the black, uh, well, well, by the PCR primer indicated by the black arrow. And if you do that, well, you see you have a cross reaction about 4%. And this is pretty typical. If you have a, a sequence variant, the single base variant in a primer site, you have a couple of percent cross reaction. So this is, this is typical for PCR. However, if we now move the uh, five prime hemiprobe, we shift it such that also the hemiprobe senses the sequence variant. Look what happens. The cross reactivity drops to 0.04. It's fantastic. I mean, remember, this is a PCR reaction. It's not digital. It's regular PCR reaction. And the reason for this is simple. First of all, uh, the impact of that mutation is much greater in the hemiprobe because the hemiprobe is about whatever, in this case, eight bases. And that means that the base variant disrupts one out of eight contacts while in the PCR case, it disrupts one out of 20. So the impact is much greater. And then furthermore, uh, you, you sense it in the downstream PCR, depending what happens in the first round. Uh, the uh, dynamic range is, is excellent. This is a standard curve uh, using uh, the two-tailed primer. Notably, the static curve is, however, based on microRNA. It's not based on cDNA or any uh, DNA uh, <clears throat> molecule. It's directly on microRNA. And the sensitivity is excellent. Uh, we detect less than 10 molecules. The reason we can't be more precise about sensitivity is that when we order a microRNA from an oligo house, they can not provide a more accurate concentration of it. So that's why we don't really know exactly how sensitive these assays are. And this is just a comparison with three of the microRNA technologies that are commercially available or described in the literature. And in all cases shown in black here, the uh, two-tailed PCR is as sensitive or more sensitive than the alternative methods. Uh, the specificity, I already indicated why the specificity is so much higher of the two-tailed PCR. But furthermore, it's not only higher, we can cover the entire sequence of the microRNA. So these uh, maps, uh, the top left one, that's the two-tailed PCR. And we are essentially testing the uh, seven uh, different, oh, sorry, eight different members of the LET7 family. 
and uh, using uh, eight different uh, two-tailed primers. And you see we have very, very low cross-reactivity. While the three other maps, they, they show alternative technologies. And depending on the technology you use, you always have kind of islands where you have very, very high cross-reactivity because the alternative technologies are not sensing the entire microRNA sequence. Uh, this is a benchmarking against uh, 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 TAC manusase or really validation on biological samples. So uh, essentially we are analyzing seven different microRNAs in seven different tissues. The data are normalized relative to each other and we use the two-tailed PCR and we use TACMAN. And you see the agreement is really excellent. The two methods follow each other. And you can also see that in the scatter plot, the correlation is really, really good. There is really only one exception that is indicated by the red arrow. And that is uh, for a, one particular microRNA, the MER30C13P in liver samples, where we were able to pick up uh, the microRNA using two-tailed PCR while the TAC assay was not sensitive enough. Uh, then uh, we already discussed about the isomers. Uh, there are very different variants and they seem to be important because certain isomers seems to be expressed particularly in certain tissues and, and those uh, isomers typically differ by their three prime and modifications. So, and these are always challenging to, to analyze. Using two-tailed PCR, we have actually two options. We can either design an assay that will actually uh, detect all isomers simply by targeting uh, a conserved sequence region, or we can design two-tailed PCR assays, one for each isomer, if we want to distinguish between the isomers. We can multiplex. Uh, using two tube multiplexing, multiplexing is trivial. We simply uh, add one two-tailed uh, primer for each target. Uh, this is an example where we do seven plexing. Uh, in, in the right uh, hand side, we have a scatter plot comparing the seven plexing versus single plex reactions, seven separate single plex reactions, and you see the correlation is excellent. So when you do two tube multiplexing, you do the RT in the first tube, and then you essentially split that material for single plex uh, PCR. And in red here, that's a standard deviation of replicate experiments, and they are as good as any RT PCR uh, experiment is. However, we can also do one tube multiplexing, and this is really cool. Because when we do one tube multiplexing, we use probes, but the probes are directed against the hairpin of the two tailed primer. And that's a major advantage because this way the probe is generic. We can use the same probe for all our assays, and that is a major cost saving. So, <clears throat> and the reproducibility is great. He, we actually ran 10 replicates. And you see uh, the CQ uh, is, is really the same on all these replicates. Uh, this is the publication. So it's, and it's really not that difficult to design your own assays. There are qu quite a large number of publications out there that have done that. Uh, uh, however, if you are lazy or whatever, convenient maybe, that's the better word, then uh, we have an agreement with uh, Bio Vendor, and uh, they have, I think, today already three, four hundred uh, two tail PCR assays available off the shelf that has been validated. And they also have a, a program for custom design of new two tail PCR assays. And as an example, really to, <clears throat> to stress how how well I wouldn't say simple, but but how uncomplicated it is to design new assays. So BioVendor were first in the world to design uh, assays for SARS-CoV-2 microRNAs uh, 
using, and, and that was because they were using two-tailed PCR. It simply went faster to design and validate those assays. Uh, however, we can use two-tailed PCR also for other biomarkers like DNA, uh, testing for rare mutations or rare sequence variants. So this, the, 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 uh, essentially the uh, workflow is very similar. The difference is that we use a DNA polymerase and then the two-tailed primer is typically sensing the sequence variant with one of the hemiprobes. And of course, if you use a short hemiprobe, it can be down to five bases. You have fantastic specificity. And that is illustrated here to the right. These data are actually it's qPCR data, not even using probes. We use dye-based detection. And we have very, very clear separation between the wild type and the uh, 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 mutant. And in green, that's actually when we uh, sense the hemiprobe uh, or rather the sequence variant using the longer five prime hemiprobe. So really the difference between the mutant, that's the blue and red in this graph here. Uh, here are some uh, examples where we also use uh, probes. So this is uh, uh, ACTN3, that's an assay that are, is testing for your muscle fibers. And essentially, uh, you see that we have very, very nice separation in a scatter plot. The reason that there is a spread of the replicates is that this, the, the conditions were not even the same here. This is a primer titration. So it's, the data shows not only do we have very nice separation, but the assays are very, very robust. So even if we change the 2T primer concentration, uh, we still have very, very nice separation. Uh, this is another example using NRAS. Again, regular qPCR, we have excellent separation. And the separation can be either in CQ values or in uh, arbitrary fl fluorescence levels and end of the reaction. And this is just a summary. Again, I'm still talking about qPCR only, where we were testing the specificity of the two-tailed PCR assays, uh, starting with 50-50 or 1-1, 10% -1, uh, mutant, 5% mutant or sequence variant, 1%, 0.5 and 0.1%. And for the NCTN3, uh, we easily reached down to 0.1%, while for NRAS, we reached down to 0.5%. But again, be aware, this is still qPCR, There's, and, and it's, it's a pretty straightforward assay. Now, if you look at uh, digital PCR, uh, <clears throat> uh, the two-tailed uh, PCR is no problem to run in digital. This is based from the uh, data for, with the NICA instrument from Stilla. Uh, to the left, we have a wild type sequence measured in the FAM channel. And these are wild type samples. Here we have the mutant samples measured in the HEX channel. There is essentially no cross reactivity at all, or there is no cross reactivity. And then if we now analyze a sample where we have 0.1% mutant, 99.9% .9 wild type, uh, he, here is the uh, chip and here is the enlargement of the chip. You can clearly see uh, with eye the, bright, uh, the difference between the bright positive mutant reactions and the background with the wild type sequence. And uh, here is this uh, data for the ACTN3. Again, wild type and uh, mutant samples, wild type to the left in the FAM channel, mutant to the right in the hex channel. And again, looking at data measured with 0.1% mutant and 99.9% .9 wild type sequence, uh, you see again very clearly the distinct positive signals from the mutants, uh, the, the mutant uh, 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 templates. And uh, these data are uh, from uh, our collaborators in Lund, they designed two-tailed PCR, and I think this could be quite interesting for this particular audience 
to measure microRNA editing because microRNA under certain conditions in certain cells is actually edited such that uh, a base change is introduced, which of course affect the activity of the microRNA. And uh, uh, they designed assays for MER uh, 379 uh, editing using two tail primers, one for the wild type or the original sequence and one for the edited sequence. And uh, they uh, tested or measured the amount of wild type and edited variant in, in different tissues. And uh, th this is supposed to or was tested as a biomarker for prostate cancer. And they wanted to distinguish between benign prostate hyperplasia and prostate cancer. And uh, they got a, a significant difference in the level of microRNA editing and here are survival curves that indicate that the, the, the degree of microRNA editing of, of or rather the amount of fraction of um, edited MER 379 can serve as a very reliable biomarker. And uh, in fact, when they started uh, this uh, study, they were not using two-tailed PCR, they were using uh, commercially available assays and then they designed their own based on two-tailed PCR and found that to be over 1,000 fold more sensitive than the commercially available assays they had tested. And of course, they made, that made us very happy because it really proves the two-tailed PCR works in other hands than ours. <clears throat> and then <clears throat> finally, uh, just a few slides of, of uh, uh, doing more, kind of, you know, uh, working out in the field. Uh, so uh, this is a blood prick sample collected. So what we wanted to do is, can we do a PCR directly on a drop of blood that is essentially skipping uh, DNA extraction? So uh, working with the various detergents that uh, we have been actually working with for over 15 years. We have an, a few products on the market like the cellulizer. We were pretty successful optimizing this workflow. So uh, uh, this is uh, uh, examples of grand performance SNP assays. Es <clears throat> essentially, the, here are our, our assays and here is a TACMAN assay. The reason again that uh, you don't have distinct clusters is that we are actually analyzing three different types of samples. We are analyzing G blocks that is synthetic material. Then we also uh, obtain standard reference material from Equalis. And this is for a SNP that is of importance or in, uh, or, or rather a risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. It's the APOE uh, genotype. And uh, the third group of samples are actually clinical samples uh, patient samples provided by the gene doctor. And uh, uh, it works really well. And today uh, we have a number of assays available already. And essentially we believe that we can analyze up to 50 SNPs starting from just the one microliter of blood. Uh, the analysis time will depend, of course, on the qPCR instrument. But if we have work with a fast instrument, we should be able to get it down uh, to less than 30 minutes because there is no extraction. We use, just use a drop of blood and this uh, opens up for uh, essentially field testing, uh, bedside testing and testing directly in doctor's office, for example, for uh, variants that are of, of significance uh, for pharmacogenetics, that is what, what drug to uh, prescribe and, and, and also the dosage to prescribe. So this is what I wanted to share with you today and I'm happy to take...